we welcome Italian artist and filmmaker Francesco Vizzoli, creator of The Truth Behind Party Politics, who will explore party politics, hedonism, and entertainment. Moderated by Joseph Grima. Good, good afternoon. Uh, I apologize with everyone. I've never done anything so stupid like keeping my sunglasses on, but you don't want to see my eyes because I didn't sleep the whole night because I had to work, so sorry, but uh, I keep this on because otherwise I, uh, my, my brain blocks. Apologies. Grazie a tutti per essere qui. Thanks to everyone for, for being here. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks, Francesco. Nice. And uh, so, yes, I'm supposed to start. Uh, and uh, Gor Vidal was used to say, uh, politics is uh, like entertainment, but for ugly people. And uh, probably he was right. Uh, we're not going to go into that uh, with the state of Italian politics at the moment. But uh, I have an exhibition right now in uh, Rome at the Fondazione Giuliani. And when... Uh, uh, Fondazione very kindly offered and proposed me to uh, make uh, this uh, exhibition uh, uh, as I normally do, I guess. I, 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 I like to think of myself as a... Uh, now, some people may laugh about it, but like uh, haute couture, I don't like artists that take their artifacts and put them in places and they just, uh, you know, they take one sculpture and they move it to another place and they just don't think too much about the context. I'm, I actually overthink about the context and so I thought the opportunity of making an exhibition in, in Rome in this moment in history was an interesting chance to, to, to study and to try to explore the roots of the entanglement between uh, uh, politics and entertainment. So I contacted a, a very helpful lady called Lydia Corbeau, Livia Corbeau, uh, who for her uh, professional history has uh, worked with all the most important photographic agencies um, in, in Italy and in the world. And I asked her to find out for me as many pictures of, of, as possible of uh, Italian politicians with celebrities, but before the uh, arrival of Berlusconi into the political realm. Uh, so it was an attempt to, to analyze when this, uh, uh, following the collapse of the ideologies, politician decided to slowly maybe try and substitute ideologies with celebrities. Uh, so ideologies were something the politicians were clinging on to convince the masses to vote for them or to give them support uh, and belief. And, but when it, ideologies were no longer there, uh, politicians realized that uh, celebrities could be uh, a, 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 a pot equally pot uh, powerful vehicle. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an evil, devilish, perverse turn of fate, uh, then uh, quickly we arrived to a stage where uh, starting from Schwarzenegger, etc., etc., or starting from Reagan and then Schwarzenegger, etc., etc., celebrities became politicians themselves, and now we know uh, where we are. The images that you see behind me are the images of the uh, of the exhibition, and uh, I don't uh, know. Uh, I think this exhibition is somehow. Uh, um, fitting the title of this uh, uh, convention, but I don't know uh, to which extent, because uh, in any one of these images, there is, uh, uh, I couldn't call it po post-truth, but I could, I could say that in any one of these images, there is a 50% of truth, a 50% of fiction, and not always the 50% of the truth belongs to the politician and not always the 50% of fiction belongs to the, to the entertainer. Um, I guess, uh, yes, that's, that's my last uh, project and uh, the next project will be 
uh, Roman sculpture with uh, Joe Ponti ceramics uh, or uh, an exhibition about uh, decadentism li literature and Huismans as an art critic for Musée d'Orsay. So each time I try to to construct a, a, a different narrative uh, according to the to the location and to the cultural environment I'm being offered. So in this case, I felt that Rome needed uh, or deserved some sort of, uh, um, I, I'm not gonna say reflection or analysis because I cannot provide that because I'm not an historian, I'm not a, a political expert. Uh, Rome needed, uh, in Italian we would use the word uh, a spunto, which in English I guess it's a, a hint to start uh, rethinking a moment in history we, have n we should now start uh, 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 putting into our archives. Uh, as, a, as a final uh, point, uh, uh, we decided that we needed a very specific and very uh, um, edgy titles for, this, for these images, which in most cases speaks, speak for themselves. Uh, so we called this uh, very renowned uh, and highly respected political expert called uh, Filippo Ceccarelli. Uh, he has studied, the, I would say, in a very anthropological way, the behavior of Italian politicians for the last 30 years to such a high degree of expertise that his entire archive has been acquired by the Senate of the Italian Republic in an official way. So he's probably the most uh, uh, autorevole, uh, I can't say authoritarian, I would say authoritative, authoritative uh, expert on the behavior of Italian politician and he gave the most uh, uh, hilarious and, uh, and uh, transient title to these, to these images. Uh, so this was my a little uh, gift for uh, Rome, and I guess it fits uh, the, the post-truth or pre-lie uh, pre <laughs> topic that we discuss in this uh, symposium. No, uh, thank you, Francesco, for the introduction. I think it's a, uh, in a way, I think that your work, which I've been following, we've been uh, known each other for many, many years. Um, I think the first time we met was when we were publishing an article about your work in Domus yes. in the yes. days before the Rai project. Um, it was the trailer, I think, for the, the remake. Um, uh, and in a way, I think one could, in a way, I think you've been, uh, in a way, quite prophetical for uh, within the Italian sphere of a certain, you, you really succeeded in identifying a certain dynamic that became prevalent. And if I think about then, I, I would, certainly for myself, I was completely innocent to certain political dynamics and to the, the sort of the importance of spectacle and of entertainment as a political instrument. Um, and of course, at the time, I must, uh, I was also incredibly skeptical. It was, uh, it seems like, ah, yeah, this is just a trovata, like a, a kind of, and I think now, of course, looking back, you, your figure and your work has taken on a completely different and rather disturbing sort of uh, premonition of what was to later come. So in, in that sense, I mean, you kind of fulfill a certain uh, role of a well-known function of the artist in sort of identifying certain sort of cultural filoni culturali of certain cultural directions or of uh, uh, the, having the sensitive almost of a medium to understand where society is headed. Uh, but what is the, uh, I, I guess my first question for you would be, I mean, it's a, a question that's asked many times and it's a, a question that in a way is, has no answer, but no definitive answer. But in this particular moment, what for you is the role of the artist? Uh, the role of the artist, wow, that's a huge question. Uh, I know what is the role for me. Uh, first of all, it's very strange because when I started, I was, uh, and I don't uh, have any resentment left for that, but I was criticized for my use of celebrities, uh, etc. So I, I, kind of, I, I was the pop whore and now I'm like the political expert and it's very funny how this shifted because maybe all the other artists became much worse pop whores than me and so it's 
this is hilarious in a strange way. I think the, the role of the artist should still be to at least to give us some kind of a, a fantasy. I mean, if some artists, they don't feel ready to engage with a uh, social or anthropological criticism, they, they, they should at least be uh, very ambitious in their commercial fantasy. So for me, uh, uh, I can accept, uh, uh, I can still love the project that, for instance, Damien Hirst did two or three years ago for the Pinot Foundation in, in Venice, uh, because it was so absurdly ambitious, commercial, Hollywoodian in, 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 a, in a surreal way that you know, it went beyond the, the, the financial expectation. So in that sense, yes, money were involved, but at least he, he, he was selling as another type of dream. The role I cannot, uh, I cannot deal with is the role of the, of the, of the decorator, uh, of the producer of, of luxury objects that get sold in different colors, in different shades, in different sizes all over the world at art fairs. And I'm not being moralistic. I, I simply, uh, I don't judge them, I don't criticize them, I don't resent them, they simply bore me. I don't have an interest in, in what they do because one painting after another painting, uh, and then as well, we, we, you, you have been such an expert in architecture, uh, I was discussing yesterday the, the, the Luke Toymans show at the, at the Pinot Foundation right now. And Luke Toymans is a highly politically engaged painter, at least for the shows I've seen of him in New York or in other places. But being Palazzo Grassi so big, uh, Germano Celland made a very smart observation. He said uh, Palazzo Grassi can hold up the kind of exhibition uh, the, when there was the Agnelli family, so they were a very historical exhibition, very dense with history, with narrative, etc. The moment you display 200 paintings of, of Luke Toymans in Palazzo Grassi, you, you, you do feel the, the, the risk of uh, the, the, these, these, these paintings become, become object. And then, for me, uh, after the first floor, I lost the interest in the exhibition. So I don't know if this is an answer, but I, I tried. I, I guess a kind of a, a different way of also kind of putting the same question is, uh, do you see yourself as a political artist? Or do you see your work as political? Because I mean, I think it's not enough to simply have, it, the, the, the fact that there are politicians in, the, a recurring figure in your work doesn't in itself make it political. So this is, I mean, of course, it's uh, everyone maybe has their own views about this, but I'd be interested in, your particular, do you intend this work to be political? Uh, n not as much as some people would wish it to be political. F for me, I have a very precise point of view about, uh, uh, and I am ready to be criticized about that, and, and this is my answer to your question. I think in this moment in history, in Italy, in France, in England, there are uh, spe specific figures, I don't even need to mention their names, that just exactly like Berlusconi uh, was uh, 25 or 30 years ago, they become the, the, the object of, uh, they, 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 they become the magnet of, uh, of tension, of criticism, of desire, of anxiety. The, the media, the, 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 now the social media, they go crazy about it. So for me, I would prefer to be uh, an anthropologist rather than a, than a, than a historian of politics. I, I, I think it would fit better my, 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 my knowledge. I don't have enough knowledge about politics, but I can tell, I think, uh, human behavior. So th th this, this is a, a, the kind of answer. And so if then my art for someone is political, I accept it because that's the way they, they read it. For instance, this exhibition was incredibly entertaining because people had such a, a wide range of reactions. So for some people I was making, uh, I was ridiculizing the subject. For other people, I was just historicizing them in a very detached way. And I know I'm, I'll, I'll make it short, but it was like when I did my first uh, 
public uh, uh, visible uh, outing with the Verushka installation at the Venice Biennale. Some people would come and uh, cry because they loved the glamour of it, the idea. And I remember clearly one museum director who came very angry to me and he said, like, she looks so ugly now, you destroyed my erotic dream of my adolescence. So when an artwork generates a very conflictual reaction, I think is a good sign. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting because in a way, kind of going back to this this the sort of thematic uh, thread that connects all of your work, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times on the run up to the European elections, where there was a sort of observation from the outside of the the general European dynamic, and the, uh, in fact, the article picked out specifically the Italian. Uh, condition, the sort of the Italian, uh, the field here in Italy as in fact having always been to some extent a certain laboratory for also for the rest of Europe but also for the US and for the rest of the world and how certain dynamics manifested themselves here in Italy before and I think there are many examples, uh, Berlusconi is one of them, the, the similarities between Berlusconi and the current president of the US are quite uh, uh, in fact almost sort of disturbing uh, or um, even I think in a way um, a certain kind of uh, sort of parallel between uh, the, what is um, happening in Italy in terms of a certain kind of uh, uh, migratory politics that's always been on the front line of the last decade or two and what is currently really kind of coming to the head in the US. Uh, but beyond that also really the kind of the relationship between media and um, which I think is something that goes back in fact much longer, much further as you have really explored all the way back to the 60s and 70s and uh, for example also the kind of your work on the archives of Rai which really kind of extrapolate the idea of uh, the media's centrality in political discourse even when it's dealing with entertainment. And so I, I was quite interested in this idea of politics as a form of entertainment which I think is, comes out of this show and in your previous work in, in for example your uh, Francesco Vazzoli Guarda Rai the idea of entertainment as a form of politics, of how sort of national discourse and national opinion is something that is really uh, in many ways possibly more uh, effectively determined in the, on the stages and on the sound stages of Rai than on the, uh, the Campidoglio or um, uh, Senato or, another, on, uh, or Parliament, any of the sort of official. Um, uh, and, and so, what is what, how, and I think in that sense, you also have a role as an Italian artist or somebody who kind of grew up in this context and was formed by this context, observing this generation of Berlinguer, Craxi, uh, then later Berlusconi, and so on. Uh, as a, a form of kind of artistic pioneer in the sense. Uh, is that something, a role that you recognize yourself in? Um, I don't know because you, you always propose me roles that for me are too much of a compliment. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I see what you're saying. I, 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 uh, now I connect back to the question you asked me before. For instance, this, uh, this spring I accepted to be the co-host of a TV show in Italy. Uh, no, I didn't tell it to many people in the art world. I didn't uh, uh, speak about it on artistic magazine. But of course, for me, it was a, 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 an experiment. And uh, echo. Now I found the answer for your question. For me, the role of the artist should always be to push the boundary, to take the risk. So when I accepted to do that TV show, and I knew that even if the uh, authors of the TV show were very respected, the writers and journalists, th th there was a, I was being put in a position where I had no control, no political control. We may have had uh, Elisa Isoardi as a guest, and at the time she may have been the girlfriend of Salvini, and I would have been sitting there, and how would I relate to this woman? Would I relate to her as a showgirl? And I'm not so sure if I like her, maybe. I would find her much more interesting as the girlfriend of a woman that, uh, as the girlfriend of a man that in ways that I may like or not like, is shaping the global politics. So, uh, echo, now I found the answer for the other question. To push the boundary for an artist is always a, a, a good thing. Uh, this other uh, mm, kind of pedestal you put me on top of. I, 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 I don't know, all I can say is that uh, uh, I, I take one pride that when I did the democracy piece with Sharon Stone and Bernard-Henri Levy doing the candidates, 
uh, I actually, because I'm moving the, the, all my books in, in my studio, uh, last night, completely by chance, I found the cover of the Democracy book, and it says, Make America Strong. <laughs> and I didn't realize that for, for, for Sharon Stone, Mark McKinnon, who is a very respected uh, political uh, professor at Harvard, he, I think the slogan for Trump is, Make America Strong Again, no? Echo. It was the same slogan, and I, rem I, I remember the American critics and the American collectors, especially, as you, as you sort of said, uh, kind of being a bit like, uh, oh, this time you pushed it too far, this is a mockery, this is a kind of thing you would see on a Saturday Night Live show, or something like that. And then I, I was there last night, after the conference, uh, archiving my books, which is why I didn't sleep. Uh, and I see Sharon Stone, and she's bearing this thing, and says, make America strong again. So, uh, what can I answer? Io sono Cassandra. Exactly. And that's, a, I think, also, a, a, I mean, obviously a role of great responsibility. There's, uh, I wanted to, maybe we can talk a little bit about the thematic that I think is really central to this conference, which is the, the idea of the responsibility and the agency of the artist in... Uh, quote unquote post truth era, and I think the first question is like does this i think there 's something inherently dangerous in the idea of post truth on the other hand, I think it's a, uh, is something that we have to maybe be not too complacent about and really kind of question our own position on this, but there was a very interesting the architect uh, Paul Virilio, um, who 's also kind of a writer and architectural theorist, um, was very interested in the idea of catastrophe of um, wreckage of uh, uh, of entropy in general, I guess. Uh, he had this um, brilliant aphorism that um, the invention of the ship is also the invention of the shipwreck. Mm -hmm. So everything that has one sort of transformative function or others that, that represents kind of a, a, a huge collective advancement in potential and possibilities also inherently bears immense risk. And in that sense, media, which is, I mean, journalism in itself is, it, it's difficult to sort of challenge the idea of journalism as a positive uh, as a value, as, a, uh, as, as something that a democratic society relies on, but it's also, in a way, something that we kind of a little bit tend to idealize, um, and that we tend to kind of question the, 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 the responsibility in a way that there maybe there's a, also a dark side to this, and also the idea that kind of entertainment is also, in a, in a, in a way, can become the vector for a very partial or non-representative idea of the truth. Uh, absolutely. <clears throat> At the moment, uh, I was invited by Anzur Recoberist to, to, to work on a project, and Anz just uh, teach, t taught me, is that the right way? Taught me a word called hyperstition, which I didn't know. I, I, uh, I proposed to him a project which should be like a, a documentary that is based on a false premise, but everything else is true. And he said, I had no idea I was proposing something so uh, like uh, conceptually <laughs> relevant. He said, this is a perfect example of hyperstition. So I see your point and I see what the point of what Virilio is saying. I, as a Almodovar would say, as a child, I have a problem with post-truth as I was telling to a journalist that just interviewed me because when I was a kid, I refused the communion. You know, in Italy we have communion when you are eight years old, and uh, um, and the, the, the I, I didn't. I, my grandparents were Catholic. My parents were not really ob observant, and so the 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 the, the religious uh, teachers at school they would come and they say why why you don't want to take a communion? You know, all the other kids are taking communion, and they say well. They said, you have to take a confession. And I said, why do I have to take confession? He said, because you have to confess all the lies you have told to your parents. I said, but I never tell a lie. I never told a lie. And they said, we don't believe you. I said, you must believe me. Because my parents, they allow me to do whatever I want. My grandmothers, they allow me to do whatever I want. And you've seen that in my work. You can get it. And so... Uh, I said to the religione teacher, uh, to the priest, I said, I'm not going to take communion because I've got nothing to confess because I never tell any lie. And I still have a 
tremendous allergy for lies. So for me, this entire concept of, uh, of post-truth is, I have to confess, objective, but incredibly uh, scary. So if it's, uh, if it's uh, an experiment that an artist is making, if it's a book, if it's a, if it's a documentary, if it's a mockumentary, if it's uh, that, I can accept. But, uh, but this, this thing that, uh, you know, this, there are some, some, some lies that slowly become truth and they can generate money or interest or even uh, the shift of political votes, uh, uh, makes me incredibly afraid. I think unconsciously I am addressing some of that in my work, but as a, as a human being, this concept of a, of a lie for me is, is a very... But kind of the counterpart to that is, do you think, in, and really can put very bluntly, do you think there is such a thing as truth? Uh, in, 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 in the in private life, yes, because the, the, the world is full of men that, you know, cheat on their women and they have children with other women and they hide and they say, I'm going to Florence and instead they go around the corner and they have another woman with three children and another family. So that is true versus lie. So I think... Uh, it's in public life, for example. I mean, you more than anybody else have spent mm -hmm. time and energy investigating the representation, how a certain sort of idea or quote unquote truth can be spun out of the representa out of representation about a certain narrative, the construction of a narrative. How does that relate to the reality of facts on well, the ground? I'll give you a very personal answer because I think if it's a personal answer, it's more honest, it's more truthful. Uh, I tried to live in Los Angeles and I needed to live in Los Angeles because of my profession, because I needed, you, 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 you get it, and the people who know a little bit about my work, they can understand why I needed to live in Los Angeles. Uh, because I needed to stay there, to meet the actors, to convince them to be in my work. Echo, uh, in Los Angeles, for instance, the nature, the fact that, as everybody knows, is a one, one business city, and that business is the business of entertainment, was the, or I'd say the business of fiction, uh, the fact that the business that rules, or that ruled, now it's not like that anymore, but until, let's say, uh, until 2000, you know, it was a one business city, and that business was fiction, everybody was immersed in a fiction. And the fact that social media didn't exist in a strange way made a, a kind of a general lying even more possible because no, no fact checking could be made. So I'd say in those fields I've worked and that I've walked through, uh, yes, the definition of truth is nearly impossible. I've experienced that with actors. Uh, they're all surrounded. I know this will sound like gossip, but instead is an is a, is a objective answer I'm giving to him. Since now we have actors that become candidates to run countries, we have to take actors very seriously. So actors in Hollywood are surrounded by entourage, as we see in TV series, etc. And uh, very often they are lonely, isolated, and they end up... Uh, uh, taking advice is, uh, this is not uh, a joke, really from people who work for them because they are too scared of, of sharing their weaknesses or their fears. And this makes them not only very vulnerable but very ignorant at the same time. And this is an entanglement that can become very dangerous. So that's why I had to leave Los Angeles because I felt in that city, as everybody says, not only you are as important or as uh, uh, relevant as the, the, the amount of money that your last movie made, which that can be true, is follow the money, you're making money, everybody wants to be with you. No, that is acceptable, sort of. The unacceptable part is that truly every three words said in Los Angeles, two are a lie. And in Los Angeles is the only place where I had a nervous breakdown. And I knew that that nervous breakdown was connected with the fact that I could not uh, separate truth from lies that people were telling me. Strangely enough, uh, this kind of uh, 
mechanism, as I, the first sentence I said, you know, like uh, Gore Vidal always said, uh, politics is entertainment for ugly people. They seem to belong a lot uh, to, to politics, uh, and that's why it's another field that I don't think I will ever enter. And that's why I even removed myself from the, from the field of actors, because the, the, the level of, uh, of fiction was, was too high for me. I don't, uh, I'm not saying this to impress the audience, but they say so many lies. There is, there, there, there is so much, un, there are so many untrue things around their public or private persona that for me, it's always, at this point of my life, hard to imagine to have sex with them. <laughs> well, that says it all. Um, I mean, no, because it's true. <laughs> like, I mean, independently from the dynamic... I don't think there could be a more damning statement. Than <laughs> no, but in, independently from how you achieve the, the, the sexual thing, you know, whether you, because you're beautiful, I'm not, so you're, or you're paying, or, or you have a position, whatever. But there, the, 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 the lie is so deep. And equally, I would find it extremely difficult to imagine myself having sex with a politician. I would, it would, I would be afraid. It would be like puncturing your, uh, the, the, this image, the construct that you had created of that person. I don't know, I would feel sex is, 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 a, is, is a moment of truth, and, and, and otherwise it's not sex. You have to feel that you are desiring and you're being desired. If you don't feel that, you give up and you do a, go and do television. No, Allora? <laughs> uh, uh, allora, when you feel so much fiction, so much theater in this other human being, you, you can't imagine having sex with them. That's for me is a proof that they're It's lying. a form of performance. And it becomes a form of performance. For them, me, no. They think I'm the performer, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the spectator. <laughs> I think it, it, any, if anybody has any comments, it's uh, really possible to jump in. I have one last co a question for Francesco before uh, we begin the kind of a broader conversation. But do you think Kanye would make a good president? No, please, no. <laughs> no, Kanye, no. Is he here? No, I hope not. <laughs> no, no, Kanye, Why? no. Why? Well, it may sound presumptuous. I met and On the basis of this sort of trajectory that you've really outlined of sort of politics being subsumed into entertainment and vice versa. But, I mean, it's a logical I, I, endpoint. I'll say one thing that is basic and one that is arrogant. First, he supports Trump, which is honestly something I cannot endorse. If I had been a friend, I mean, I had dinner twice on, a, on actually, this should be said at Maxi. Once I had lunch, me, Herbert Mushamp, the critic of the New York Times, Zaha Hadid, and Donald Trump. And that was at the time when Herbert was trying to convince Donald Trump to uh, uh, work with Zaha Hadid. I will not get into details, but you can imagine it was like being uh, when there was the Cold War, having dinner with uh, Nixon and uh, Brezhnev. I mean, uh, impossible. Impossible. There was no, no, no connection. No communication. Uh, no communication. And, uh, and the other thing is that I've met Kanye two or three times. and. Uh, when he speaks, I, 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 I don't understand. He's exactly the, the, he's the materialization of that. When he speaks to you, even in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a private situation, you cannot tell, absolutely not tell, of the things he's saying to you, what is true and what is not true. And that scares me enormously. And even if he is heterosexual, I have no interest in corrupting him to come to my side of the, of the sexual game. He's a person that for me, I could never have a, a physical desire. For, on the contrary, Jay-Z, for instance, you can tell, he's a businessman, he's like a, you know, a star is born, Beyonce is uh, his creation, Jay-Z is sexy. There is a kind of truth to Jay-Z, but can you know? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a microphone for, oh, you have one. Uh, you said something earlier that really fascinated me. You said you would rather be anthropological than political. So does that mean that anthropology is a more accurate depiction of past events rather than written history? It means that for me, I'll quote this writer that just wrote this incredibly accurate book on, uh, on, on Mussolini. His name is Antonio Scurati. 
uh, is a very respected writer in Italy, and he spent like five years writing the book uh, on Mussolini. So for the most obvious reason, in the last months he has been invited to talk show universities. And he has, I have already heard him once or twice repeat this sentence that we should stop at some point focusing on studying uh, the, uh, the, as an object of desire, the, the icon, the movie star, which is the politician. We should, to try to understand the political moment we inhabit, we should start studying more all the people that have voted for this politician and why they are behaving in such a way, why they are believing in, to this person. So for me, to study uh, Trump is something that is like studying uh, an actor, is like studying a, a goddess, a movie star, uh, if, if in a very negative way. To study all the people that have voted for him is a form of anthropology. And I think we should all make an effort, and uh, if we have a range or anger towards some politicians that we don't like, try to engage in a, in a dialogue, in a study, which is anyway a form of dialogue, because if you study someone, you, 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 are, you, you, you connect with his, his beliefs, his weaknesses, his fears, to the people that are supporting what we don't like. Is this an answer to what you asked me? Almost. Basically, anthropological studies are less uh, fabricated rather than, because written history is always basically data, some kind of data, this event happened, this uh, World War II started, and it's more like, a, let's say World War II is always more like a military, we always know the military history, but we're not much aware of the anthropology, the zeitgeist on the society, so it's maybe it's a more, more uh, realistic, more unbendable fact. For, for me, yes. For me as well, there is a, the problem of vanity, no? the, the historian of the Kennedys. He wants to get down into history because he knew the Kennedys. He's studying the Kennedys or, you know, a, a, even if he's a friend of mine, a perfect example is Bob Colacello, who was very close to Andy Warhol. And now Bob Colacello's job is to be the go down in history after his role at the factory as the official biographer of Nancy Reagan. And I think Bob is perfect for doing that job, uh, and he deserves that. He's a perfect second act in his beautiful, fantastic life. But obviously there is an element of, uh, of vanity. In Bob, there was obviously an element of vanity in Mrs. Reagan, etc. The anthropologist, I at least this is my maybe naive vision of the anthropologist, studies more the... the, the the behavior of the common people, their weaknesses, their fears, their religious beliefs, the reason that lead these people to, to, to vote, to, 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 to create an idol. So at this point of my career, so I'm sorry I have to personalize the answer, at this point of my career, after so many idols, I'm more interested in the people that create the idol rather than the idol. Does it make sense? I think it's a, you mentioned the word vanity there, which in a way has also been something that has underpinned a lot of your work, a kind of a fascination with the vanity of individuals and the, this creation of a self-celebratory persona that, uh, that, that goes on the stage, no? Uh, yes, it's like, uh, f for me, I, I had an epiphany when uh, I, I was invited to Qatar to make an exhibition and I, and I had an audience with... Uh, with Queen, uh, Queen, I don't know, say like Queen Moza, I don't know the definition because Sheikh Moza, I, I apologies. Uh, uh, but I mean, I, I, I found myself facing uh, a, a woman that has molded herself, uh, taking as an example the most glamorous actresses of the 60s, but she was the vehicle for political values that were completely in conflict with the aesthetical values that she took as a reference. So it was, 
for me, when, 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 when I entered her office or I spoke to her, uh, was was like uh, uh, shocking. In a, of course, in, in a vanity sense, in, interesting because it's an episode I can I can hold in my life as a as another uh, brick of experience. But uh, yes, vanity is a, is a huge element, in, and in the era of social media, vanity seems to be seems to be everything. I mean, many people uh, credit uh, the victory of uh, Salvini for his very smart use of the social media. Strangely enough, I don't have Instagram. I don't have. I don't use Facebook. I I I, I find uh, all those devices uh, not uh, negative or dangerous per se, I just feel in, inadequate, uh, actually. I, I feel I should travel with hair and makeup all the time <laughs> to do Instagram. <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> Your bar is probably higher than most people's. So. Um, are there any more um, questions from the, from the floor? From the dance floor? The dance floor. <laughs> No, I, I, I guess maybe just to kind of wrap up the, the, the topic that we were going, um, that we, what we were talking about before and this sort of relationship between entertainers and uh, politics, ultimately as, as, as a sort of a bottom, which in, in fact you turned out to be surprisingly critical of this sort of uh, mediatization of politics and the politicization of entertainment and so on. Is this, it, are you intending your work to be a sort of a, an expose, a, a critique of this? dynamic of this phenomenon, which maybe is inalienable, inalienable from uh, the dynamics of late capitalism. Maybe it's actually kind of an in, it, a necessary part for our, some society to work how it does. Between criticism and expose, I prefer expose because I think uh, if the artist uh, through a painting, no, we, there are some paintings in history of art that depict royal family, or social classes, and they and they make uh, through a little trick they make a mockery. I love William Hogarth; he's one of my favorite painters. Or you know, we can think of famous Spanish court paintings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I I recently discovered that there is a, an entire uh, blame my ignorance. There is an entire uh, section of uh, um, paintings belonging to the 18th. 17th, 18th century, which are, uh, uh, you know, a bit like William Hogarth, but mockery of the of the religious, uh, uh, like cardinals and popes and priests depicted in behavior that should not be. So, when the artist, you know, takes a snapshot, and this is snapshot, whatever medium the snapshot implies, this uh, image exposes something that has not been exposed before, I think the artist has done, has done his, his job. Then the criticism is, 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 a, is a kind of a supplement to the, to the magazine. The, 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 real, the real tombstone is not the criticism or the moralism that the artist can make. The problem is that if the politician becomes too much of an entertainer, at some point, uh, he will lose the cred his credibility, whether the artist is criticizing him or or not. is a is a is a is an inevitable process. It's like uh, the Greta Garbo lesson. You know, if you if you stay if you stay hidden, uh, you you you'll preserve your mystery forever. Otherwise, if you start selling your mystery very early in your life, you, you, you burn out. Actually, it was yesterday on the news that uh, uh, the uh, organization, come si chiama, de, de, la, de la Medicina, uh, the burnout is, is finally a, 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 re a real medical condition. A real medical condition. So it's, it's in the eyes of everyone. You know, if you start uh, at six years old like Michael Jackson, by the age of uh, 25, you, you, you've burned out. And uh, so if you, if you start spreading to everyone through the social media everything about you, at some point your narrative will be over and nobody will like, put likes on your Instagram and neither give vote to you. And you'll be even more depressed because you've become accustomed. It'll become a sort of downfall. Uh, absolutely. Maybe so. in that respect, um, uh, who are your political heroes? 
<laughs> who are the heroes of this? Uh, I mean, we've kind of seen a lot of obviously figures who you have a very ambiguous, or almost sort of critical or expose relationship to, but who would be, uh, I mean, is, is the sort of the, the usual Winston Churchill? No, I, I, the more I study Winston Churchill, the more, the more he comes out as a, and then like the late when he goes on the boat of Onassis, uh, Maria Callas, not terrible, he sounds like a socialite, no. <laughs> No, 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 no. I, 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 I would pick up. There's a very Napoleon. interesting. Eh? Napoleon. But even worse, <laughs> another, another. Gandhi. Me, me, eh? Gandhi. See, but tu, tutti troppo vanitosi in one way or another. No, I prefer. There's a very interesting anecdote about Alcide de Gasperi. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen several documentaries about his life, and uh, he's not glamorous at all, but there is an episode that his daughter uh, recounts. Allora, she's like seven years old, he's at the peak because he's after the war, he's uh, running uh, the Christian Democrat Party, which is like, you know, running our country. And they travel through Piazza Venezia, you know, which is where is the balcony from where Mussolini. And, and exactly in Piazza Venezia, there is a big, big crowd that recognizes that this is the car of the Gasperi. And they start screaming at him and waving, you know, because the war is uh, recently over. So he's, a, he's a, like a national hero. And he turns to his daughter and, and he says to his daughter, be careful, be careful. Every compliment can be as dangerous as any attack. So in the end, not the politicians I prefer. I think the smartest politicians are the ones that can shield away any form of excessive behavior. Those are the ones that hopefully you can think will be able to hold the bar of the boat straight and run a country properly. Are there any uh, final questions from the dance floor? I even quoted the Gasperi, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise we uh, either move on to Gramsci or uh, maybe call it a day. No, yeah. no Gramsci, <laughs> I didn't sleep. It would be a bit too, exactly. Yesterday was Almodovar, if today you give me Gramsci, I'm like, I'm gonna faint. To <laughs> exactly, drop. I thought that would be um, a good way to uh, uh, threaten you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Francesco. Grazie.